everyone, I'm Sostine and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be making an 1898 Worth Gown inspired gown for the incomparably fierce Queen Estrella for her to wear to a ball in France. It is Le Bal de Legende. Really hope I pronounced that correctly. Le Bal de Legende. Ha! Well, today we'll talk about the inspiration and the design of the gown, as well as the construction of the skirt. The plan is that the next episode in April, we'll make the bodice and show off the final look and hopefully get videos of Estrella wearing her gown at the ball itself. By the way, there is a giveaway at the end of the video, so please stay tuned for that. For those of you who don't know, Queen Estrella is a good friend of mine who has just the most incredible personal style. She basically lives the epitome of princess core and royalty core, wearing fabulous, beautiful dresses with tiaras like every day and absolutely everything she puts out there is fun, hilarious, often education and always on point. She is mostly on TikTok and Instagram and soon to be YouTube, I hope. I bet you didn't know that Queen Estrella. Bye, Nightly. In any case, I bet you didn't know that Queen Estrella has a degree in design and we thought it'd be really fun if we collaborated to make a dress for her. With her designing a dress and me making it, I agreed to make her any dress from any era that she designed because I thought it'd be really kind of fun whether it was Tudor, fantasy, or 18th century, really anything that she wanted. Granted, she already has a full 18th century wardrobe because I gave her a bunch of my gowns. After a while of deliberation, Estrella ended up picking an Edwardian era style gown reminiscent of those made by the House of Worth, but none of them an exact copy. The House of Worth was originally founded by Charles Frederick Worth, an Englishman in Paris who was originally a fabric salesman who opened up his own design house in 1858 and and then from there on went on to design and clothe empresses, princesses, socialites, incredibly wealthy heiresses, specializing in gowns that exemplify high quality fabric and really perfect fit and design. He really had a great eye for and matching them with the right fabric for the right person, really which is a fantastic gift and one of the most important parts of design itself. And that is the signature of his work, really use of fabrics in a great silhouette. In any case, before Worth came along, dressmaking had really been a woman's art and you see tons of beautiful detailed work made by brilliant women seamstresses that were never signed by the maker, which is honestly heartbreaking. I never know who made any of these gowns. Now, I want to say that there were of course exceptions to this, such as Rose Breton, Marie Antoinette's designer, but those amazing women who were celebrated for their designs in their lifetime were definitely not the norm. Charles Frederick Worth and his House of Worth really started the idea of the designer and he is often called the father of haute couture. I don't know if you can tell, I'm actually really salty about this because before him, fashion really was women's work and it was the art of women. It was also decreed by the wearer herself. I did find this interesting quote about Worth from Business Builders in Fashion 5 by Jacqueline Kent. She remembered the days before Worth's arrival in France when fashion had been de determined by the women of the royal court. But once Worth had established himself as a designer, he had created dresses of his own choosing rather than simply making what the queen of and her lady selected. Now everything was different. Not only did Worth decide what he would design, he also designed who he would design for. She had needed a referral from a friend to see him. The woman would actually work with her dressmaker to design a dress that she wanted and the dressmaker would make it reality for her. This made the wearer as much a part of the design as the dressmaker. And this is why women like Madame du Pompadour or, uh, who you know I'm kind of obsessed with get a lot of credit for deservedly setting the fashion trends herself and in this way having agency. Now I do wish that the talented dressmakers that Madame du Pompadour and uh, Georgina Cavendish worked with also signed their names so that we would know their stories as well but I would like to emphasize that this was in fact a woman's trade before Worth came along and took it away from women too. Like instead of women deciding women's fashion, wow now it's a man deciding. Yeah that's kind of how I feel about it. And of course not women, women who came before him who made even better stuff never got credit and he comes along he takes all the credit so I don't know I'm a little salty. Hand it to a man to take that agency away from women and take it for himself and then for that to be considered the norm thereafter. If you want to learn more about this I highly recommend Abby Cox's video on the subject. She goes into it with great know-how and flavor. But regardless, salty or not, that's what happened. After Worth died in 1895 and his son Jacques-Philippe Worth took over as head designer, he started. To, he actually designed the two dresses that Estrella ended up picking, which are of course these two, which are 
gorgeous. I really do love these. I think that the shapes of his gowns in general are absolutely gorgeous. And the House of Worth's use of fabrics is of course unparalleled and I could see why they were famous for that. Between the flared skirt, the wasp waist and the full bust, I mean, this era is just beautiful. It's just ultra feminine. But if you've been following me for any length of time, you've got to know that embroidery is my favorite part of a dress. And in my opinion, Worth's embroideries is like, really simplistic. I'm not talking about when he sends something out to a different country and has the people from that country embroider and embroider and he brings it back. I'm saying like when his house does the embroidery, the embroidery is basic. There is a reason why every gown I do from this era is either made up taking parts and shapes from worse gowns and adding my own spin for and like designing my own embroidery onto it or just doing a different designer altogether like Kalosuer when they actually collaborate with Hector Guimard to make his wife's wedding dress. Like he just, Worth just doesn't do embroidery that was like all that cool in my opinion. But Worth's embroidery is generally like HFFA, like hot from far away. And it degenerates the closer you look at it. Like, like let's look at this one. It's beautiful. Look at the clouds. They look so cool. And then you get close up and they're like circles that look more like popcorn kernels. Like the embroidery was a homework assignment that was done because it had to be like not celebrated on its own. So it's just like, I, as an embroidery person, I think it's not for me, but that doesn't mean we can't improve upon it. On the other hand though, the other gown Estrella picked is not embroidered, but brocade, meaning these butterflies were actually woven like this and for the design of the skirt itself. And I think this like design is perfection. Look at the detail and gorgeousness. I mean, Worth's fabric and the way he worked at the fabric houses to make it, like those are brilliant. Estrella and I do both love the shape and ideas that his gowns have. So we decided to take the best of all the gowns and put it together into one. Estrella came up with this Brilliant idea, but we would use stars for Estrella instead of butterflies. And we would of course redraw the clouds ourselves to make them less bad. All digs at worth aside, I wanted to make the clouds look like traditional Asian embroidery because I do have an obsession with traditional Korean embroidery, which I find incredibly beautiful. Straight came up with an idea of how to redraw those. Now, while I love a lot of the shapes of the skirts in worth gowns in this era, I particularly love the movement of the flare of the pink one with the wheat embroidery. Again, what are your thoughts of the wheat close up? I'm, I'm done digging. I'm done digging. I'm, I'm done. And um, let's move on. The butterfly skirt and the celestial Celestial skirts are, are both very, very beautiful, but I really don't like having a center seam in the very front of the dress. I actually find it kind of distracting looking. So I went with the shape of the pink one, which has a front panel, which does not have a center seam. This one looks like a seven gore skirt. So after some mock-ups not shown here, I decided to go with the truly Victorian walking skirt pattern as a base. Please note that I did make some changes to the original, original skirt pattern. Namely, I first added fullness to the back of the skirt by adding six inches to the back panel for a total of 12 inches since that does get mirrored since there's two of them. That when I pleated up the back, it would give a more dramatic drape. I also added in an 18 inch train by adding 18 inches to the back of the skirt panel along the bottom on top of the two inches that I did add because Estrella was taller than the pattern itself. And then I slowly tapered this to the gown edge along the back panel as well as the side front all the way to the middle side. I also added in a 2.5 by nine inch placket to the skirt back so that I would would have a placket already built in. Again, put it together and made a mock-up out of cheap cotton muslin. Now it was time to do a fitting with Estrella. I was supposed to go to New York City anyway in January to do a fabulous bustle dress photo shoot with some friends, uh, something Estrella was also part of, and I took the mock-up with me. Meanwhile, Estrella had collected her corset, which she had gotten from Red Threaded, and as well as her petticoats, which I think she got from Period Corsets, and we did a quick fitting. Personally, I think that the secret to a beautiful skirt is proportion especially when it comes to embroidered skirts. So if the embroidery is too small, I don't think anyone really notices it. And when the embroidery is too big, it can look a little cheap and oversized. I decided the most important thing during fittings was to figure out the proportions of the embroidery. What I did was have Estrella put on the skirt with all the under things, of course. And together we decided where to put the embroidery and how big to make it. Wear the seam of the leg and follow upward. I love it. Following that, we can continue that same pattern like this, 
Estrella then used her immense skill with drawing to draw out the clouds themselves. We also put the stars where we wanted it so that it would be in the same kind of swooping motion as the butterflies. Sadly, we only had highlighters on us, so that's what we used to draw on the skirt. We also did a fitting for the bodice at the same time, but I won't bother talking about it in this video since that's for the next episode. So once I brought the skirt mock-up back home to Chicago with me, I took the buried line drawings and kind of just cleaned it up because there were, it was just kind of getting a little messy, redrawing the sketches to, um, to firm up the lines with Sharpie. As for the stars themselves, what to make the stars look like? We flirted with a lot of different star ideas, including the seven point star on this one, and of course the nine point star on Empress Cece's dress, which is also a worth creation. Ultimately, Estrella thought that the stars from chapter 19 of this Korean manhwa, kissing with God's eyes covered is like the rough translation, or on Manta it's actually called When Fate Finds Us, great manhwa, were most like the ones that she wanted. So I used this as a jumping off point for the embroidery. I didn't want to use outlines for the stars. I wanted really solid ones. I wanted it to be full of thick, metallic, shiny embroidery so that it would shine as much as possible. So I filled in the stars with a mirror line down, the, down each point. I designed around seven different stars to use for the gown itself. And though I plan on using this particular design for the bulk of it, since it seemed like the most Australia one to me, I got around $500 worth of really awesome Madeira thread. If you do machine embroidery, Madeira thread is by far the best. It's thicker than the others because they have 20 weight and 30 weight threads and they don't break as easily so it's a lot less frustrating to work with. Once I had the threads I started stitching out the stars, did some test prints to choose the colors and started embroidering out samples. Meanwhile, it was time to figure out the materials for the dress, other than this thread, of course, even though the thread's like the most important part. Now, the original Worth dresses were all made of this incredibly rich and luxe satin. I went with my favorite source for it, which is New York Designer Fabrics Double Face Silk Duchesse. Theirs is the closest I've seen to actual historical satins. I sent around six, seven different samples for Estrella to play with, and she picked this beautiful Cinderella blue one. Can't lie, I was kind of hoping she'd pick the midnight blue. And as I did the project, I realized she was right. That blue Blue was perfect for her. Oh, spy nightly. Now we have a pattern and embroidery design, inspiration, the fabric, and thread. So it's time to actually start making the dress. I initially started by scanning all the dress pieces in. Once I scan these in, I combine the pattern pieces on my Adobe Photoshop to make the pattern pieces on my computer. Please note that I put a ruler on it so that I would always know the scale. I then digitized them using my embroidery digitizing software, Palette 11 by Babylock. I placed the stars where I wanted them in conjunction with the pattern that Estrella and I had come up with on the skirt to make sure that it was just in the right place. Since each skirt panel is quite large, the smallest was actually around 18 inches wide and 40 inches long. The digitizations were all way too big to be stitched out all at once. I broke down each design for the skirt panel into smaller pieces that I could stitch out on my embroidery hoop, which is again 14 by 8 inches, which is already huge. Now the original Worth gown had the clouds stitched onto some somewhat transparent lace. So mine were done on this gorgeous ivory silk satin from New York Designer Fabrics using two shades of metallic silver threads because it just the white just looked very fluffy and rich and I thought it would look good that way. I then started stitching all of this on on my baby lock venture. Around 75 hours of machine embroidery later I had all the pieces I needed for the skirt. Of note I stitched out two big stars for the front and the back center of, on silk organza. This was done so that I could cut it out and turn it into appliques to be sewn onto the gown after the clouds were on it so that they could bring the clouds and the gown itself together. Again, skirt, lace, clouds, stars. Those are the layers that's going to be on this dress. That's all of it. Now that the dress pieces were done, it was time to cut them out and sew it together. The dress pattern was placed onto the embroidered panels and, the, and then carefully cut out.
ironed it and placed it with a cotton muslin wrong sides together for flat lining. The silk itself is already very thick, but I find that this particular fabric could use a little bit of stabilization with some cotton or something else. I find that a cotton muslin is just perfect or a thin cotton poplin if you prefer. I like to use a contrasting cotton thread so that it's easy to pick out if I need to. After all the skirt panels were flat lined, I started sewing the skirt together. Now, there were a few things that I did a little differently in this skirt than I would have in other skirts. I wanted a few of the stars to cross the seam line so that it felt a little bit more magical, like there's stars not just in the front and the sides and everything, but they would actually cross the lines on top of the seam line. You'll notice that Worth does this on a lot of his gowns as well. That way there's no area that just doesn't feel cohesive. To do this, I sewed the sides up except for around the star that would be popping out. And then I cut the star out where I wanted to, to cross the border, just on the side where it's gonna cross, very close to the embroidery. The embroidery itself will act as a protective edge to prevent any more fraying. I then popped the star through to the other side and folded down the fabric around it. Finally, I sewed the embroidery down over the seam so that it looks like the star is crossing the lines of reality itself so that it's really on top of the seam. <laughs> After that was done, I added in some facing along the bottom. Originally, they would have used tarlatan, but I use an iron-on interfacing because I find that it works just as well, and it's much faster. After the skirt was put together, I hemmed it to the length that Estrella had wanted, about one inch above the floor. This was done by folding over the edge of the seam twice and hand sewing down the hem using about six to eight stitches to the inch. There's just nothing that beats a hand hemmed edge for this. I also added in the waistband by ironing down the seam allowance on one long side and then stitching the fabric to the other long side, pleating it where I needed it to go, and then sewing this down by hand. Now it's time for the lace. I wanted the lace to look almost like rain coming from the clouds. And I found this glorious white lace on Etsy and bought 15 yards. Uh, by the way, I ended up using only 10. The original is this gorgeous silk machine lace from the turn of the century that has sequins sewn onto it. But I don't really see anything like that on today's market. So one that I picked has a smattering of sleer sequins that really sparkle way more than even the photos show it to be, do. I cut out the edge of the lace and then started pinning it to where I knew that the cloud embroidery would stop. I hand gathered all the way around, around a ratio of two to one, meaning that there is for every two inches of lace, I gathered it to one inch. This way the lace feels luscious and gathered and full. I then machine stitched the lace all the way around using a two millimeter stitch on my baby lock soprano. Now this machine stitch will of course be covered up by the cloud. Clouds, I, after I stitched out, I cut out of the white fabric two large clouds, each a mirror image of the other, and started pinning it in place using the lines I'd stitched onto the silk as a guide.
honestly, whenever I make an outfit, there's a moment when I realize that it's going to be beautiful. This one I had high hopes for from the beginning, but I wasn't 100% sure that it would be just as beautiful as I thought it would be in my head until this moment when I pinned the clouds on and I knew it was going to be glorious. Once the clouds were pinned on, they had to be sewn down by hand. I used metallic thread all the way around so that it would hide into the metallic thread of the clouds. It took around 24 hours of hand stitching for just the clouds, but it was so worth it because I really love the effect. Afterwards, it was time to add the final stars. They were stitched down to silk organza with the backing of tearaway stabilizer from Baby Lock. I took away the excess stabilizer, leaving just a star. I then cut it out carefully using embroidery scissors and I actually made four different stars in four different colorways and played with it on the skirt until I found a combination that I thought was just right. I then pinned on the stars and then sewed it down very carefully by hand. As you can see, there's just a lot of hand sewing in this. Another thing that I added that I thought was really cool was a loop in this gorgeous beaded braid I got off Etsy. Actually, Estrella found it and sent it to me and she said she wanted it for the dress. It was sewn underneath the cloud at the center back. This way, should Estrella want to dance, she can loop the train to her wrist and then dance with the train in a most romantic and historically accurate manner. The nice thing is that there's just so much going on in the back already that when you drop the train as well as a bracelet, you don't even notice the bracelet thing unless you really look for it. Then it was time to rhinestone the crap out of this dress. The original butterfly gown was also rhinestoned and I wanted Estrella to sparkle too. I wanted Swarovski crystals, but they stopped selling to the general public apparently. So I ended up going with the next best thing, Preciosa Maxima rhinestones. From I used Hotfix to put them on, which is using this like special tool. This was actually my first time using this and I thought it was going to be so hard, but I was delighted with how easy it was. Literally all you have to do is turn it on and then put the rhinestones where you want it and like just dab it with, with the Hotfix tool for about three to four seconds and then let go and that's it. You move on to the next rhinestone. So I'll link those tools down below, but it was really easy. I put these all over the lace of the skirt and in a circle around the back star. At the end, I used around 1,500 rhinestones on the gown. I bought around 6,000, so time to make more gowns. I also put in a Sostein logo into the back of the skirt so that Australia wouldn't forget who made it for her. And also, so at least some of my garments are now signed by me, unlike so many garments I see in museums made by unnamed but incredibly talented women whose stories I wish I knew. Last but not least, I put in some bars and hooks for the closures, as well as four around the waistband so that the bodice could hook in and keep the two together. And you know, that way you don't see the inside of her dress when she moves. And the skirt was done. Cue montage now. Holy shit, that is me. What the fuck? I don't know how it's maintaining its shape. Which? Which? Look at these big birthing hips I have. Ha ha, it's a lie. Da, 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 da. Can I twerk in this thing? <laughs> Still got it. Hips don't lie and I'm starting to fuse you, boy. The sweetest thing any person has ever done for me involving a dress. This will save my life. Can you imagine if someone tries to give me shit in this thing? Nah, nah, nah. hear me out, hear me out. You wanna date me? Never. Oh, you thought you wait. <laughs> Look at her perusing about. Oh, who's she? If you think this is good, just wait till you see it with the bodice. Oh my god, I'm so in love with it. And I really want one for myself. Good news though, I plan on making myself an 1898 gown so that Astrea and I can both wear sister ball gowns. Now hers, of course, is clouds and stars. And mine, of course, will be clouds and bees inspired by this one. And I will talk more on the embroidery later So when I make this gown in May. Meanwhile, don't forget to subscribe and turn your alerts on so that you can follow up with my next video in mid-April showing how I made the bodice and the final reveal, including shots of Australia wearing it at the ball.
hopefully. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you love the gown as much as I do. Now, if you've watched this far, here's the giveaway. If you could have me make you any outfit in history or movie or whatever, with whatever embroidery you wanted, what would you pick and why? I want to hear about your dream outfit. I definitely read the comments for this, so let me know. I'll pick three comments one week from today. Three of you who win, I'll mail you a special gift, which is a kit to make a huswif, also known as a sewing kit that you can make yourself, stitched with the same embroidery and made with the same materials I used to make Astrea's gown, complete with mini folding scissors and seam rippers and everything. So more information in the comments below. See you soon!